Good afternoon, everyone. Hello. Oh, <laughs> I wasn't <laughs> waiting for a response. I just wanted to get a good look at you all. I just wanted to say hi and, and just kind of take a moment, take stock of who's in the room. And those of you who may be joining us uh, via Zoom, I know it is that season for sure, flu season, colds, sickness, allergies as the seasons change, just a lot of stuff. I know that there's a lot of uh, illness and, and sickness out there, especially if you have kids. So praying constantly, this is a season that I'm, uh, Pastor Q as well, really, really praying for um, immune system protection for all of us um, and to do our parts, of course, um, getting the flu shots and, and things like that to try to stay healthy. So praying for all of you guys. Um, all right, um, it's already October, can you believe it? Like, I feel like this year has just gone by so fast. Already October, and I told you this before, but Christmas is absolutely my daughter's favorite holiday of all time, and she starts counting down quite early and gets really excited. Um, and I did, I looked on the, there's a website that tracks Santa across the world or something like that, and I saw that the countdown officially today is 75 days until Christmas, 75 days. You can follow Santa uh, going around the world. And then after Christmas, as you know, um, a few days later, it's literally the end of this year, literally the end of 2022. As I have gotten older, time has just really just flown by really, really quickly. Remember the days when you were in high school and you think that time is just standing still and you're never going to, you know, see summer vacation, you're never going to become a senior, never going to get your driver's license, all this stuff. And then you become, you know, my, our age, and time just won't stop for anyone. So I was taking stock of this year. We're in the middle of October or kind of beginning of October, and I realized that a lot has already happened. A lot has already happened, some good and some bad. It's not always all good, right? I'm sure that you all have experienced, as I've, um, same as me, you've experienced some high points as well as some low points already, right, starting in January. And this year brought major changes, as you know, to Hope Church. This was a year of major change for us at Hope Church. Uh, we implemented the three axes, as you know, uh, not only do we have the Sunday corporate worship, but you guys know that the three axes, we've added other things, and we've incorporated the Friday night house church, so everyone should be in a Friday night house church, and then we have the weekday currently happening on Monday nights, a Bible study, a systematic foundational Bible, uh, Bible study that we've begun on Mondays, and that will continue, and there will be like uh, course 101, 201, 301, 401, etc. So I'm really excited about that, this axis that um, is here at Hope Church. And, but the funny thing is that it's, it's pretty much a fact of life that most people don't like change. Most people don't do well with change. People like what's familiar. People like what's comfortable. People like what they're used to. I know a lot of people complain about the status quo, you know, we need to bring revival or we need to, you know, rebel against this or, you know, demonstrate against that, you know. But at the end of the day, I think a lot of people, those I think are the minority voices, but most of us, a lot of us, we, we like the status quo, even if the status quo is not good. Do you know what I mean? Because it just takes way too much energy, effort, just a lot of resources, just everything to try to change something, even if it's not good, right? We would rather keep the not good and keep it the same because it's comfortable and it's familiar. So it can take a long time for people to accept change, for people to adjust to the change, for people to ultimately embrace the change, right? Especially when things are difficult. If you immediately see results and things are going well, you make a change and you see instantly that you know, you're gratified by making that simple change, things are like so much better now, right? Well then, you know, it's easier to accept. But when things are difficult, when that change is slow in producing results, when there are challenges, 
when there are hindrances, when there is even opposition against the changes that you're trying to make, um, when these opposition and hindrances and challenges come our way, it may be tempting, very tempting to just drop it, right? It's very tempting to just quit, to just give up and just say, eh, you know, and throw in the towel. Whether it's our job, when things get hard, you get a new boss at work. That one annoying coworker, you know, suddenly gets moved into your office. Things are hard, right? School, some of us may start a new program, master's degree, or some of us, you know, graduating high school, thinking about well, should I go to college or not. Things are hard, right? And so you wanna just, you wanna drop out of a class. You know, maybe you signed up for this, this AP class, or you signed up for certain courses and you drop out. Relationships. Maybe your marriage has just gotten really hard. Marriage is really, really hard. And you're thinking about, mm, what are my options? Maybe you want to cut someone out of your life because, you know, the whole cancel thing, because it's just gotten really hard dealing with that person, that relationship in your life. Or, really, this is the saddest fact, some people just want to quit life. And we know that with the mental health um, awareness, it's, it's, it's a real thing. People are just checking out of life altogether. There's lots of suicide, attempted suicides, as well as successful suicides. Or, so people want to check out of life. So we all have these times where we go through discouragement. We all have these times where we experience depression. Um, and we want to give up. We want to quit. So if you're struggling and feeling in any way like that, feeling discouraged, feeling like you want to give up, feeling like you just need to run away, today's message is for you. So I want you to listen carefully and closely. Um, the title of today's message is Be Encouraged. It's going to be from Acts chapter 18, 1 through 11. Be Encouraged. And we're going to be looking at Paul's experience in Acts 18, 1 through 11. And we'll look at that um, later. We're not going to read through it right now, but if you have your Bibles, I mean, of course, the verses will be up here, but if you have actual Bibles, just open it and keep it to Acts chapter 18. All right. So throughout the Bible, I want to begin with the Old Testament before we get to Paul and in the book of Acts. Throughout the Bible, we read about God's people. And these people, a lot of them are discouraged, and a lot of them, they have so much opposition, so much stacked against them, they, they feel like giving up. And these are people who are great leaders. These are people who are like amazing, incredible, great prophets. And yet these great leaders, you know, God's leaders, as well as um, God's prophets, they too go through moments where they want to give up. So there was Moses. We all love Moses. He's one of the greatest leaders in the Old Testament, and he was handpicked by God. When he and the Israelites are wandering in the desert for many, many, many years, all those years, the people complain bitterly to Moses about their condition. The people complain bitterly about the fact that they want to eat meat. They should have, you know, never left um, to come out here and suffer like this. You know, they're just really complaining against him. And Moses wants to give up. When you have that many people, when you're doing, leading that many people to something, and all you hear is complaints from them, that's quite discouraging. And so same thing, Moses is human. He wants to give up. The task was too great. So he says to God in Numbers 11, if you look at Numbers 11, verses 14 and 15, he says, I cannot carry all these people by myself, God. The burden is too heavy for me. If this is how you're going to treat me, please go ahead and just kill me now. If I have found favor in your eyes, and do not let me face my own ruin. If I have found favor in your eyes, just kill me now. This is at the low point. This is what Moses is saying. He is so discouraged, right? And then there's Elijah. Elijah, we know him as one of the greatest prophets. Elijah himself. He's the one that challenged all the prophets of Baal and won, right? That's how much power and authority he has a epic showdown with all these other prophets, and he wins. But he had his moments of discouragement too, as we know, we read in the Bible. He too wanted to quit. So from 1 Kings, this is about Elijah. 
Look at 1 Kings uh, chapter 19, verse 4. It says, While he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, he came to a broom bush. He sat down under it and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. This great prophet that just had this incredible victory and you know, just this um, awesome display, and he here, we find him at this low point where he's asking, just like Moses did, just take my life, right? We're also familiar with Job, right? When we think about Job, he is synonymous with what? Suffering, right? We think about Job and how much he suffered, how he lost everything. The Bible calls him blameless and an upright man of God. That's how he is described. He's blameless. He's an upright man of God. But when everything was taken from him, everything, his physical health, his children, his wealth, his property, everything was taken from him. He wished that he had never been born. Have you ever felt a time in your life where you wish that you had never been born? Well, this is Job. So let's look at Job chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. After this, Job opened his mouth and cursed the day of his birth. Can you imagine cursing the day of your birth? He said, may the day of my birth perish, and the night that said, a boy is conceived. That day, may it turn to darkness. May God above not care about it. May no light shine on it. On the day that he was conceived, on the day of his birth, right? This is what he wishes for himself. So finally, looking through the Old Testament, we see all these, you know, Moses, Elijah, uh, these great um, men of God. You see that they, there were times of great discouragement where they did want to give up. And so today's text, we're going to look in the New Testament, and we're going to look at the Apostle Paul and his experience in Corinth. So as I said, keep your uh, Bibles open to Acts chapter 18. In Acts chapter 18, we find Paul in his second missionary journey. (coughs) He's in his second missionary journey. He just left Athens, and he arrived in Corinth, and he is alone. So at this point in his journey, he's (coughs) he's already been beaten, He's already suffered in jail in Philippi. He's been persecuted at Thessalonica and also in Berea. He's been ridiculed in Athens. I mean, he's had all this happen to him. He's been beaten, persecuted, ridiculed, you know, um, made fun of, and he's been thrown in jail. All these things have already happened to him. So here he is now in Corinth. What we know about Corinth is that it was a very important commercial port city. Is right on, um, you know, the the ocean there, and so it was very, very large, very commercial port city, large and prosperous. It was also known for one of the very largest temple. It was the temple of Aphrodite, and who knows, Aphrodite, goddess of love. Temple of Aphrodite is the goddess of love, and it was famed for its one thousand temple prostitutes. One thousand temple prostitutes there. Now, Corinth was absolutely, it was the most corrupt and immoral city in the Roman Empire at that time. Very corrupt and very immoral during that time in the Roman Empire. And I believe that at this time, now, Paul, he's been on his first missionary journey, and this is in the midst of his second missionary journey. I believe that Paul was at a low point in his ministry right now. Here he is, he just arrived in Corinth. And I, from my reading, I believe that he's at a low point in his ministry. He was experiencing discouragement. I would even say maybe he was even depressed, right? He writes about this time, this time of just arriving in Corinth, and he writes about it in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 3. He says, I came to you in weakness with great fear and trembling. This is the state of uh, himself right now. He's he's got fear, he's trembling, and he's feeling very, very weak during this time. He was feeling overwhelmed by just the the depravity, just the, uh, the perversion that he sees, the immorality that is so blatant in this city. You know, he's just overwhelmed by this. He encounters such immorality and perversion here. 
he was also very much alone. He was alone because he left his co-workers, Timothy and Silas, back in Macedonia in Berea. So he had his traveling buddies, he had his friends, his co-workers, Timothy and Silas, but they stayed in Berea. So another um, discouragement during this time, I believe it could be the fact that he was financially struggling, that he was out of funds. You know, Paul was a tent maker by trade. We associate Paul, every time you hear Paul, you hear the word tent maker a lot. And that is because um, that's, that's a trade that he learned. All the uh, young Jewish boys, they learn a particular trade. And he was a tent maker. And it says here that he begins working to support himself. He begins making tents and working with his hands, and he begins to do that to support himself. In fact, he teams up with a couple Right? We know the husband and wife team of Aquila and Priscilla, another famous uh, two names that we know about, Aquila and Priscilla, who were also tent makers. By the way, this is where the term tent makers come from. If you don't know this, um, I, don't think, I don't hear it being used as much these days, or maybe I'm out of it, but there was a time where you know, uh, it was just such a common word that people would say, oh, there are tent makers, and tent makers, it was almost like a code word. But basically, tent maker, that's where the, this phrase came from, was they're missionaries who are in the field who support themselves by working in the local economy. So they have like a, I don't want to call it a side hustle, <laughs> it's a job, it's a, it's a, it's a you know, job that they do in the local economy and raising funds for themselves, not just taking up an offering or some sort of collection and living off donations, but they were working within the economy there. And they would be called tent makers because, again, while working there, their main goal is to be working for the Lord. It's um, marketplace ministries. It's the same thing. We, you guys are working Monday through Friday or beyond in workplaces, in the marketplace, in the economy. But again, we know what our true purpose is. So in that way, that's where we get the word tent makers. But here, Paul, he's also, um, like I said, it says that he starts um, making the tents and working with his hands. And this couple, Aquila and Priscilla, um, he works with them as well. Paul also faces severe opposition during this time. I talked about him being persecuted and being ridiculed and such. This passage in Acts chapter 18, we'll read, um, talks about how he faces severe opposition, um, again, to his message that Jesus was the Messiah. He's still preaching that Jesus was the Messiah, and people, especially those in the synagogue, the Jewish uh, people, are not having it. Verse 6 in our passage today, it says, But when they opposed Paul and became abusive, he shook out his clothes in protest. So clearly we're told in this passage that the pe people became abusive towards him, right? They were being very... They weren't just kindly just, you know, uh, making fun of him, but they were being abusive towards him. So through all this, we realized that Paul had a lot of good reasons to be discouraged. Wouldn't you be? If you were in Paul's shoes, all this is happening, right? You would be discouraged as well, I'm sure. But what I want to say today is while the enemy is active in discouraging us, God is also at work encouraging us. God is also at work to encourage us, just as the enemy is trying to discourage us. So as we examine this passage more closely, I want to bring up three things. You know, every good message has three, po three points, right, um, where you can follow. So as we examine this passage, three points. I want to bring up three things that encourage us to keep going in the midst of discouragement. So as I said in the beginning, if you are in that place right now where you're kind of feeling discouraged, you're kind of feeling overwhelmed, and maybe even feeling a little depressed or wanting to give up, listen to these three points that we can glean from this passage. First one is the partnership of friends. Oh, I did not show you this one. Uh, Apostle Paul, we're looking at Acts 18, 1 through 11. As I said, we're not going to read through the whole thing, but uh, verse by verse I'm going to kind of go through. So the first one of the three is, as I said, encouraged by three things, partnership of friends. One of the greatest God-given encouragements in our lives is friends. Amen? Amen? Friends, you guys, friends are so important. They are, I think, one of the absolute greatest, most amazing gifts. 
friends. Paul is alone, as I said, because Silas and Timothy stayed behind in Macedonia, right? So he's alone here in Corinth. So God brings Aquila and Priscilla into his life. As I said, they're this Jewish couple. They also by trade are tent makers. And the reason why they are in Corinth was because the Roman Empire kicked out all the Jews from Rome. So the Roman Empire kicking out all the Jews and um, Aquila and Priscilla being Jewish, they got kicked out and they came to Corinth and they set up shop. They set up shop here uh, to make tents. And because they are tent makers just like Paul, they begin working together. This allows Paul to make some money, to support himself. And in fact, it's not just a co-worker relationship. We do know from the Bible that this couple ends up becoming Paul's closest friends. You know, they have a strong relationship, and they become really, really, really good friends. They're a huge encouragement to Paul. Think, you know, when he's feeling alone, he's got no friends, he's in this strange city, he's being abused and persecuted and all this stuff. Here comes this couple, this Christian couple, in the same business as him, sets up shop, and they're able to work together, they're able to encourage him, and he's able to now also make money. They're a huge encouragement to Paul. In the final chapter of the book of Romans, Paul, in fact, says this, Romans 16, verses 3 and 4, he says, Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my co-workers in Christ Jesus. They risked their lives for me. Not only I, but for all the churches of the Gentiles, we are all grateful to them. This is the greeting. Look how much esteem the Apostle Paul. His word carries a lot of weight, as you know. And he writes, you know, greet Priscilla and Aquila, my co-workers. They saved me. They saved my life. And this is the esteem that he gives to them. We also read in verse 5 that Silas and Timothy finally arrive from Macedonia and they get reunited back with Paul. Let's look at that verse. It's Acts 18, verse 5. Acts 18, verse 5. This is the text that we're looking at. It says, when Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah, right? This is what happens. And then Silas and Timothy return, they get reunited. Now, when I read this verse, particular verse, you see that the word exclusively is highlighted in pink. I consider two possibilities here. So follow along with me. I think first, maybe their arrival allows Paul to devote himself exclusively, exclusively to preaching and testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. Why is that? I'm thinking, well, Maybe he's able to do that and he doesn't have to work doing that tent making stuff anymore because maybe um, Silas and Timothy brought an offering. Maybe they brought some financial assistance. They brought donations, right, from the Christians, from the churches in Macedonia, which now allows Paul to concentrate on preaching and teaching full time because the believers, the Christian community in Macedonia, sent money with um, Silas and Timothy to support him. So now he's able to exclusively devote his time to the preaching and teaching and not having to support himself. Or the second possibility I was thinking, hmm, the return of his friends. Maybe just the mere, maybe they didn't bring offering money, you know, but it was just their mere presence and their friendship. Maybe Paul was so discouraged that he was kind of backing off. He's being abused and persecuted. He goes into the synagogues, he's preaching the gospel and such, and he's getting this from the people. So maybe that's why he's taking a step back and he's doing the tent making thing, right? And so the return of his friends must have greatly encouraged him. Silas and Timothy are back in town. They're standing, you know, toe-to-toe with him. And maybe he's so encouraged by their presence, their friendship, their encouragement, their support, that he redoubles his effort and becomes more focused, and he stops working with the tent-making thing, and he becomes more focused on the preaching and teaching of the gospel. What do you think? It could be. It doesn't say in the Bible. These are my conjectures, right? One is they brought money so he didn't have to work anymore. Or secondly, it wasn't about the money, but it was just their sheer presence. Friends, they come into town. They're like, what are you doing? What what happened to you preaching? And, And he's like, oh, and he gets that, you know, boost and that encouragement to be able to redouble his efforts and exclusively start preaching and teaching again. So, as I said, the, uh, partnership of friends. Secondly, 
I said three things um, that they were in, um, Paul was encouraged by. First was the partnership of friends. The second is positive results. Positive results. When we see positive results, it keeps us going, right? It keeps us going. Let's look at verse 7 and 8. Verses in 7 and 8 says, Then Paul left the synagogue, and he went next door to the house of Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. Crispus, the synagogue leader, and his entire household believed in the Lord. And many of the Corinthians who heard Paul believed and were baptized. God blessed Paul's work with some success. Now, he wasn't converting everybody, but look at this. Although he may have had little success initially, again, when he went into the synagogues, remember, they abused him and he got kicked out, Paul began to see some fruit from his labor, right? After the opposition, after the abuse from the, Jew, the Jews in the synagogues, he was able to see Crispus, who was a synagogue leader, and Crispus' whole household come to faith. They all became believers. Now, we can either dwell on the negatives and be discouraged, or we can encourage ourselves on the positive results, on the small victories, right? It's that whole glass is half full or glass is half empty kind of a thing, right? You can look at your, uh, the failures or the um, unsuccesses that you're having, or you can look at Crispus, a synagogue leader, and his whole household. It didn't say the whole synagogue converted, but this man did, who was a leader, and not just him, but his household. Instead of looking at what God has not done, look at all that God has done. A lot of times we're so busy focusing on what he has not done yet that we miss what God has done and is doing. Finally, the third point, partnership of friends. Second was the positive results. And the third is promises of God. Promises of God. Final encouragement here. While it's true that friends encourage us and seeing some positive results um, also encourage us, the greatest encouragement comes from the Lord himself, comes directly from the Lord. When you hear directly from the Lord, how can you deny? How can you still uh, lay there, you know, and wallowing and uh, woe is me? When you hear directly from the Lord, right? Acts 18, 9, and 10. Let's look at that. Verses 9 and 10 says, One night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Keep on preaching. Get out there. Do not be silent. For I am with you and no one is going to attack and harm you because I have many people in this city. Wow. When you hear those promises from the Lord, when you're going through some stuff, right, think about this. God promises one, look at the pink, I am with you. God promises his presence, P for presence, I am with you. God promises his protection, P for protection. No one is going to attack and harm you. God promises his power. Another P, P for power. I have many people in the city. You have backup, you know? There are people in the city who have your back. You're not alone. I have people in the city. What exactly does that mean, I have people in this city? Well, there are many who will come to faith because they're going to come to faith and they're going to become God's people through Paul's preaching, through the power of God. God using Paul to preach, God's power on that city of Corinth, many people are going to come to faith. God is already claiming them. Do you see that? He says, I have many people in this city, probably people you don't even know of. He's already claiming people, allies for Paul. So he's saying, don't you worry. As we can see in Acts 18 and elsewhere throughout the Bible, the Bible is full of the people of God who at times became discouraged, right? The people um, of God in the Bible, we see them as heroes of faith. We see them as just these great, you know, uh, we, but at the end of the day, they're people. They're mere people, no different from you or I, right? They got discouraged. We get discouraged from time to time, right? And we get discouraged time to time from what? From doing ministry, right? 
A lot of our deacons and elders, we may become tired, we may become weary, the people who serve, maybe those who set up the chairs here uh, every Sunday and take it down, those who are, are serving the food, fellowship meals, those who are just uh, setting up the amount of equipment, people. Look at this. <laughs> the amount, the sheer amount of cables, you know, um, so you at home can worship with us via um, Facebook Zoom. The amount of work it takes to hook all this up, get the AV, audio, visual, and just everything running smoothly, all this. We can get discouraged from time to time doing ministry. We can get discouraged from time to time in trying to love our neighbors. When you're trying to love someone who don't love you back, you know, it says love our enemies. We get discouraged time to time from trying to love our neighbors. We get discouraged from being Christ followers. Sometimes, you know, the verse that we always quote, that you must carry your cross daily, right? Sometimes that cross is really heavy, really heavy. Some days it's heavier than other days, right? And we may feel discouraged, and we may feel like giving up. There's no shortage of discouragements to hinder the work of God. There's no shortage. So as we continue with house church on Fridays, you know, and this is just the beginning, right? We're only a month in. We started in September. This is only the um, second week of October, right? So as we continue with house church on Fridays, as we continue with the Bible studies on Mondays, uh, we had our congregational meeting last week, and I'm going to totally put Elder Lam out there. He's and he was asking, what if we leaders don't want to or cannot uh, sign up for the Bible studies? You know, what will happen? Remember he asked that? Well, he, the reason why he was asking that is because there's a lot of homework. <laughs> I think you guys have probably heard the rumors, right? They're true. There's a lot of homework, right? I mean, it's not bad. It's really good for us. And just being able to read through, um, you know, the book of John and be able to kind of summarize it, so, so, so rich and so good, right? But, yes, um, as we continue through house church on Fridays, the Bible studies and, and, you know, meetings on Mondays, as we continue to pray, as we continue to invite, as we continue to disciple people because... Lost people matter to God, and so they matter to us. I say, let's be encouraged. Let's be encouraged. We are the same as these great heroes of faith throughout the Bible. We're in the same boat. So just as Galatians 6, 9 says, this is a very famous verse, Galatians 6, 9, let's not become discouraged in doing good, for in due time we will reap if we do not become weary. Man, this is just like the perfect, perfect verse, right? In due time, we will reap if we do not become weary. And the word there is if. We will reap a harvest, you all, because we know that the harvest is plentiful. Over and over again, as, I've, as, we've, as we've begun house church, what I'm hearing from people is that there are lonely neighbors and co-workers who long to go to a place, a safe place where they are heard, where they are accepted, where they can have a good meal, where they can um, experience community. You know, people are longing for this. So indeed, there will be a great harvest. We will reap what we sow. We certainly will. So many lost people, they need to know and they need to experience the love of God. But how can they if we are not acting upon it, if we are not doing it? So I'm going to end with 1 Corinthians 15, 58, as the praise team comes up. This is the last verse. 1 Corinthians 15, 58, where Paul says this, Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. So let me ask you, are you feeling discouraged? Do you feel like giving up? We just heard about Gateway Thailand and what's happening to our missions partners um, uh, Scott and Christina Kwok. I was thinking about them and I was thinking about my three points and I was thinking, wow, I bet they're discouraged. 
I bet they're, they're feeling like, why has God brought us here to be waist deep in water? Everything that they've built up, you know, they have a coffee house, they have a cafe, they're helping to um, find work and, and um, train um, the women who've been pulled out of the red light district and who've been, you know, uh, trapped in sex trafficking and sex workers. They've been able to bring them out, uh, vocationally train them, and they're doing this great ministry there with the coffee shop and everything right helping them find jobs as a waitress at the coffee shop or in the factories making the coffee all these things and it's underwater think about that for a moment right the discouragement and the doubts and the questioning and then as uh, elder Daniel said do they have the ministry of friends I saw the um, he's forwarded an email to us too and I saw the actual photo of they're in their house, the water is rising, they look out the window and they see two Christian friends in kayaks floating past their house and telling them to get in, we'll take you to where the water isn't so high. These Christian friends come along in a kayak, it's like a movie, right? Get in and they took them to safety. So the ministry of friends. Do you think that Scott and Christina, that they need to focus on their successes, on their small victories? on what they have achieved so far, not on the loss, devastation, and, uh, and all this, right? But focus on what have they achieved through God? What are they achieving? Because of this, because of money, it's, uh, you know, they're, the neighborhood uh, there, the Thai people are in poverty and, and they're poor, but they want to raise money not just for themselves and their ministry, but extra money so that they can help their neighbors. And that is going to be a huge witness. This is a huge opportunity for the community, their actual literal neighbors who live around them, to receive help from Scott and Christina, and they can share Christ's love that way. The small victories, the positive results, right? Thirdly, do you and Christina and um, Scott, do they need to hear directly from God? If you're struggling and discouraged for something, and Christina and Scott as well, I'm sure that they are praying, 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 and they are hearing from God directly through visions, through a good word, through uh, messages from their friends stateside um, about the promises of why they went out in the first place and what God has promised uh, to do for them there in Thailand. If they remain faithful and they do not grow weary in doing good. Let's all stand. So as we close and sing this song, I just want you to consider those three things. Where are you? Are you in a place where you are feeling discouraged? If you're not, then let's pray for Christina and Scott all the way across the world in Thailand. What are they experiencing? Do they need the ministry of friends to come around them? We are their friends. We are their partners in that ministry. They are not alone right? Prayers and our finances going to them. Do they need also to focus on their successes and their victories and where are they seeing God in the midst of the flood, right? Or the third, again, is do they need to hear from the Lord a voice that comes to them, whether it's a word of knowledge, whether it's a uh, email that they receive, a text message, right at the perfect time when they're feeling their lowest. And you all too, if you're feeling that way, then I say look to the Lord and hear from the Lord. Be assured that indeed our God reigns. So be encouraged. Go forth and encourage others. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ incredible, unfathomable love of our God the Father, the communion and fellowship of the Holy Spirit, be an encouragement and be upon all of us now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. And as always, if you need a word of encouragement, if you need prayer, you may come up here and we'd love to pray with you.